Good evening, everyone. Just want to formally introduce uh, our guest speaker tonight, Aya Nianika. So happy that you're here, Aya. Aya um, was a Common Ground, is a Common Ground community member, and first encountered the Dharma at Common Ground, and now is a fully ordained Buddhist monastic, a bhikkhuni, and um, has been in that training for 10 years, although the last six years formally as a bhikkhuni, as I understand, and mostly in that training out in California, but now has been traveling. And um, we're just so grateful that that you're able to come back home and, and offer the Dharma. So much gratitude. Thank you. All right. So we'll Yes, it is high enough. I did. I kind of got the impression it was not going to be. I think that's going to be necessary. Robes are not conducive unless I do this, and that's really uncomfortable. Yeah. A long stretch of time. I would add uh, to the end of that introduction. Yes, there was a time of traveling, and I kind of came through. The last time I was through here was at the beginning of that travel, and I did some around the world and. Uh, around the world, <laughs> inside and out, and landed with another bhikkhuni, Aya Subhijana, in Washington State. So we are one month in to starting a new monastery. Uh, and that does not mean I'm no longer a member of Common Ground. <laughs> it means that Common Ground also now has a, a monastery with, within its worldview. So, so a tad more on the, on the volume, we'll get there. And I'll try to, <clears throat> please, uh, Haya or anyone, if I'm not speaking loudly enough, this is the universal sign. I can't quite see the people on the Zoom, but maybe they have someone they can communicate with. And if I'm talking too loudly, maybe you just do this. <laughs> because <laughs> how do I balance it out? So what we'll do is we'll, we'll start this period with a transition into meditation. And I don't know if people may have seen that I just did a few movements for myself before uh, beginning this space of practice. That was something that I do for a transition, like uh, and it's something that I'm just learning and experimenting with, so I could talk about that, of like saying, okay, the space I was in before, I'm just going to clear, push that to the side just for now. I'm going to gather in what I need for this time as we practice, as I transition to my cushion for meditation and this space of relating. And I'm going to expand and bring it grounded and long lifted, and it creates this setting of dignity. And then I may, sometimes often I don't need to push again out, but I might gather in again, and then with the other, down and up. And maybe you can feel in your bodies an arriving happening. And you can look around and see we're doing this together. Ooh. Okay. All right. I could feel that it was like right on that edge of squeal, which often we are. <laughs> So practices like this help us to come back into the body space. So invite, if you wish, we'll enter a time of stilling, of showing up, of being in our bodies, within the body of this community, within this space of welcome. So whatever posture is supported, and I know that those online may also have the options of a lying down posture or something that's supported in or standing. So whatever is appropriate for your body today 
and the space you're in socially. Take some sort of upright posture. Maybe breathe into it, into the belly of it. And just let the body soften around that, even if it's not you know, that perfect posture, just let it soften at first. And breathe and let it lengthen. And then settle. And I'll go into a practice of opening, but first, let's make sure we're home in this body. So from whatever upright posture you have, noticing it, adjusting, wiggling, swaying, and stilling will come. Continuing to breathe, bring the attention down into the feet. Noticing how they are right now, and if there's any little subtle or major shifts you want to do to give them a little relaxation and comfort and ease. And the same with the legs. And coming up into the buttocks and the pelvic floor, noticing how this touches in this space, everyone's on a cushion or a chair, so the surface below you. And see if there's any adjustment you might want to make in the tip of that bowl. Leaning back just a little bit, seeing what engages for me it's the lower abdomen and that feels like work and i bring it forward a little bit too far and it feels like work so maybe i go back and forth a few times to find the tip of the pelvis that doesn't feel like as much work or doesn't feel like work at all Now saying hello to the whole torso area, aware of the sensations here. Is the belly soft? Let it plop, hang down. And this relaxation still be upright if not, maybe adjust the pelvis again. So you can have a soft belly supported by the chair or the cushion below you. Out into the arms and hands. Noticing where they're resting on your body or the area around you. And for most of us, there's not any need to hold tension to stay upright in our arms and hands. So allow them to relax. Say hello to whatever they're doing and allow relaxation. Shoulders and neck. Letting any softening or moving back, forth, side, side. Sometimes there's a little bit of a crick, a little movement. Uh, it brings a smile to my face. And then noticing how is it that you have your head resting 
on the neck and maybe pulling up. You can use your hand and then you'll relax it again to that, that kind of bulb ball back at, at the back of the head, just to lift very slightly and release. So the uprightness of the head comes from the rounded spot in the back of the skull, not from lifting the chin. And then allow the relaxation. Aware, saying hello to the state of the jaw, the mouth, the tongue. And letting the tongue soften, rest. It doesn't need to work right now. It's okay if the lips are a little bit parted, the teeth loose. Relaxed. Mm, checking in at the eyes. Are they soft in the sockets? Relaxed. And inviting even the scalp, the top of the head. Relax. Now that we're aware of being in a body, be aware of breathing the body. Letting the air come in and out as naturally as it might right now. And a way of making an expanded, unbounded, open, relaxed space is a practice I'll lead us through now. Breathing in to the whole body, letting the out breath go down, intending the direction to be down as if you're breathing out the surfaces that are touching the cushion or the chair and ground below your feet. Of course, the air isn't going down out the backs of your legs, but you can have this sense of as if the air comes in and goes down. And then on the next out breath, all of the surfaces pointing up, breathing into the whole body and breathing out in the up direction as if the air were leaving the body through the top of the head, the shoulders, parts of the legs, belly, whatever's pointing up. And then curious interest, can you do down and up on the out, out breath at the same time? Breathing in and on the out breath, down and up. If you need, you can alternate between the two. See also if you can breathe in and then expanding down and up through the breath. It 
This may take some practice. And then we'll switch to breathing out the left side. So all of the surfaces of the body pointing to the left. Breathing in and exhaling to the left. Then breathing in and exhaling to the right. Letting your awareness go to the right side of the body and the exhale extending out to the right. And take a little time to do this on your own, first to the front and then to the back. And noticing some of these directions will be easier than others for most people. So just whatever it means today, breathe in and out to the front for a few breaths and then out to the back. And having done these six directions, down, up, left, right, front, back, see if it's possible to breathe in and then breathe out all of the surfaces of the body in all directions. Maybe it could be a sphere or just kind of this light, breath moving in all directions. For those of you who've practiced the Brahma Viharas, the divine abidings of love and compassion, resonating joy and equipose, you might recall how it's said to be unbounded, exalted, immeasurable. That's what this sensation of breathing reminds me of. So let's warm the heart in whatever way. If you have a metta practice, you can bring something to mind that way. Or just call to mind something that makes your heart smile. That sense of warmth, love, kindness, brightness of heart. And continuing to breathe in all directions. Let that warm, smiling heart radiate on the breath in all directions. It's not a push, it's just a flow that moves, unbounded, unhindered, in all directions.
And if you wish, you can continue with this radiating practice of loving kindness and warm heartedness over the next five to 10 minutes, turn to whatever object of meditation you like, allowing the body to be relaxed, open, spacious, loving, as you attend to your meditation object. And I'll join you in silence.
bringing this warm, spacious, loving heart into our meditation practice, priming our meditation practice, the relaxation and warm, radiating love allows us to cultivate love as deliverance of heart. Cultivate kindness, metta, as deliverance of heart. So we'll transition again. from a stilling practice back into the space of this room and the Zoom. And see if we can carry this flavor of open spaciousness and warmth into whatever emerges next. Welcome. And if anyone has any questions or um, comments about their experience, I'm not sure where I can clip this thing. Okay, we'll see how it goes. Um, how did you notice how your mind, body, heart state was before the practice, during the practice, after the practice? Do you have any comments about that? Any sharings of your experience? And I'm not sure how to monitor the online part. So oh. Use the mic if people want to speak in the room physical room, and uh, if people want to speak on Zoom, you can just unmute yourself. Use that spaciousness to speak your voice. We've got a hand. I really appreciated your invitation to ask how adjustments might need to be made, sort of that as a, I have realized that sometimes you know, when doing a body scan, I can kind of um, almost hold too rigidly to the idea of this is how the body is and I am observing it, mm -hmm. but the body is also responsive in that way and that was uh yeah that was a, a great invitation that i felt uh was very supportive to practice thank you I, that phrase the body is responsive yeah and as we're in relationship with it as we embody it we we're heightening our awareness and our relationship of course we want to be kind to it so if that means you know, moving a little bit here or here, whatever. It that it that's not a meditation crime. <laughs> that's a meditation support. Now just you know, 
that 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 movement is so fast like i can't keep my awareness on it but maybe i need more practice but if it's like oh there's a little what if i and then soften and then at a certain point it's like okay good enough for now safe enough to practice let's go with this and relaxing into what is so thank you for bringing that in Thank you. My name is Tim. I uh, I practice like this pretty frequently, actually. And um, it seems like I'm more like more real than real. <laughs> um, but the instruction I got was like, this is just a perception. So don't like think it's some kind of ultimate reality. But that when I practice like that, it does seem like, no, this is, <laughs> this is, yeah, it's more, it's more real. So what do you think about that? Can you say more about more real than real? What is the, um, it's, it just seems like more, um, like you're more aware, like, like, well, like <clears throat> things are changing all my sense experience is changing all the time. But when I practice like this, it's like, okay this is this art in this space that's that's like um there's more ch um like that's like the re my underlying reality or more like um i guess i get kind of metaphysical <laughs> How about it's your intentionality? It's your, it's it's like you're showing up. the The vectors of awareness are alive and online. Am I getting at what you're talking about? Or I think so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess I just get kind of like um, the I guess what I'm saying is I kind of get attached to the perception of it. Uh, oh, it's pleasant yeah when we're when we're in this practice most of the time people will experience a relaxing a softening a warming a meeting and um it's very different than i'm meditating now <laughs> and the body difference is that um you're receptive to reality. You're receptive to the phenomena of experience. It, I, this is a resiliency practice. So I learned this, what's called six directions of breathing from Paul Linden, who I'll talk about a little bit, uh, who's an Aikido uh, teacher in Ohio, who his practice is just so aligned with the Buddhist teaching, but it gives you a tangible way to embody it. And so this is an experience you might take into pulling all of the philosophical words out and living in the reality of contact with all around us. And try this, if you're willing, try this when you're out walking around and see if it changes the perception you have of the people, the animals, the cars, all of it see if this kind of embodiment holding shifts how you respond and relate. Thank you. Anyone online or one more in the room? All right. Then I guess we move into, thank you. Our, our Dhamma exploration for the evening or whatever, wherever you are in the world, whatever time of day it is. So I mentioned that uh, the six directions breathing was from a uh, teacher and friend, um, Paul Linden, 
Uh, I was lucky enough to visit him and another embodiment teacher, Lisa Fisher, this last week in Ohio. So I just flew in yesterday from there. And we had a wonderful week of, I would say, embodiment Dhamma play. Uh, it was uh, very, very nourishing. Um, so some of, I, I've been practicing with them over, yes, it kind of started at the beginning of the pandemic. So however long that how we're measuring time in, in, since the pandemic. Um, and Paul comes, uh, his, his main thrust is power and love. So he's looking at um, how his phrase is that uh, love without power is ineffective, power without love is brutality. And really when you practice in the way that we just did with this extraction of breathing, you find that power and love are one and the same. They're really uh, words that need to be married together to be effective and useful in the world. And he uses Aikido principles to teach that. And then Lisa Fisher um, comes from a background, a Buddhist background in another um, tradition, as well as uh, lawyer mediation communication skills and works with changing behaviors and states in oneself, in our relationships, in our communities, through understanding how we hold and move in the body. And so I've been doing work with them and then on my own and with other embodiment people. And I've been bringing that into an embodied practice of the Buddha's teaching in the words in the suttas, so that it's not a philosophy, it's a practice that shows up in the world. And that is so different. From doing this practice, my baseline has gone from like a directed, yes, I can do this and we're going to you know, figure it all out and, and kind of a low grade, depressive, must struggle to get going baseline to happiness. My baseline is now happiness. Uh, friends are smiling over there. <laughs> and that is from the teachings coming into my interactive experience. Moving it out of the, I was going to get the uh, like a physical book because it's, you know, it's hard to say I'm holding up the suttas here when, you know, it could be holding up anything. But the holding up this collection of teachings they didn't read like poetry and they didn't open my heart in the same way until I started marrying this embodiment experience with the words and the practices and the Four Noble Truths and the Enlightenment Factors. So we'll do a little bit of that today. While I was there in Ohio, we covered so many different topics. We just basically played for a week. And I wanted to bring all of it and share all of it with you. It's just not possible. So um, maybe we'll go with the hindrances. Anyone during the meditation, particularly in that part that there was silence, did anyone have something else come up? Oh, yep, hands, hands. Uh, I can't really, yep, hands online too. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyone want to shout out, don't need a mic, uh, the flavor of what those were? Sadness. Irritation, anger, pain, pain, and that's so many things. Restlessness. Anxiety. Anxiety. Impatience, that's, yeah, I love that one. <laughs> yeah, so we've got these five hindrances as classifications, and each one of the things here kind of weaves in and has a particular flavor and taste. Um, I'm kind of going through a process of like unpacking them and, oh yeah, that one, that one. 
the one I thought I'd look at today is doubt, which kind of underlies a lot of our disposition towards practice. Oh, well, the Buddha did it, but me? Or I'm sure the Buddha is probably right in a very intellectual way, but does he know what's going on in Minneapolis? Does it really apply there? So doubt, or the way it really manifests in me or has and does still. Well, I just don't have it together enough. I haven't practiced well enough. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know, maybe eventually, but I doubt that I can really make any of this work. Can you, can you feel the flavor of my voice? And if you're looking the the disposition of my body as I go through that story, uh, not me. Doubt. So there are suttas that say, oh yeah, doubt, don't do that. It's not going to be helpful for the path. Um, let's see if I can pull something up here. It says, giving up the hindrances. Okay, wait, let's step back. Let's step back. Um, to some extent, so people raise their hands that they, they've had some sort of hindrance. And when I say the word hindrance, you know, that's a Buddhist technical term. But what are we hindering? For me, it's that, well, for all of us, <laughs> I think in the practice, it's that openness, that expansive, that wellness, that strength, that lovingness, that balance, that I was trying to get us to taste a little bit as we were doing that meditation practice. And so a hindrance is something that gets in, way, in the way of you feeling the qualities and acting from the qualities of expansive, open, loving, strong qualities that allow you to meet things, to have resilience, to thrive, to show up, to continue to say, Yes, this too. It's like this. The, yes, this too. So the hindrances are the things that get in the way of that openness. And they're the thing that gets in the way of us being willing and capable to still. Willing and capable to come to a softness and a settledness. So all the jibber-jabber doesn't have a hold, nothing to hold on to. The hindrances are the thing that the jibber jabber collects and runs with. So that's what I'm going with as, as the definition of the hindrances. And there's a sutta called giving up the hindrances because I'm guessing each of us would prefer that open expanded state. If you want, you can try, you can just, shrink, smallify a little bit and say, okay, A, it's an eye test, or B, A, or B. And the choice is easy for me. And as I practice with moving through the world in this state versus this one, and anyone who comes on Monday, we're going to go through this in a much more embodied, uh, I won't just sit up here on some sort of platform way, so you can come and play with this. Um, how this state allows me to be unhindered as I move through the world. So the sutta giving up the hindrances, the section on doubt says, practitioners, I do not see a single thing that gives rise to doubt or when it has arisen, makes it increase and grow like irrational application of the mind. An irrational application or a um, 
let me see another uh, a a improper attention a a way of paying mind to this that is not really sane. <laughs> Practitioners, I do not see a single thing that prevents doubt from arising or when it has arisen, gives it up like rational application of mind. And when you apply the mind irrationally, doubt arises. And once it arisen, it increases and grows. Okay, great. Now I've got some words here. And the, the poly, this is useful word in poly because the, the saying it's irrational application of mind sounds pretty heady, <laughs> unintended. Um, the word is yoniso manasikara in Pali. And that means, uh, this is the definition I got from uh, Sutta Central's collection of the dictionaries they use there. Radical attention. So it's radical, the way that we pay attention. A proper attention, a prudently applied mind, a wise reflection, a focused attention, an attention to the source. So yoni, yoni somana sikara, yoni, the word itself means the source or the womb. From once this is born, the arisen, the 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 space from which this arises, the source of it. So we're attending, and the word, ma, so the mana is the mind, and kara is to do the deeds, the actions. So it's the actions of the mind attending to the source. Okay, again, a lot of words. <laughs> but these words begin to direct us back into the body the source where we can experience doubt and where we can begin to understand its impact and where we can begin to change and shape it. So we'll go to another sutta, um, one, of, uh, one of my current favorites. <laughs> I have a lot of favorites. I favor a lot of them. And this one's Ahara Sutta, nourishing, nutriment. And it goes through the, the five hindrances, and it also goes through the seven factors of awakening, the qualities and characters. And we're not going to cover those, but I would love to do a whole series. Maybe we'll start this summer online. We'll see a whole series of unpacking all of these, what's five, the 12, uh, <laughs> 12 qualities, the hindering and the awakening factors. So this one is what nourishes. And I got to this sutta in two directions. One, because I'd said my last week with these embodiment teachers and friends was so nourishing. And the other, because uh, Aya Subhijana, who's the other monastic at Pasadi Vihara, just did the sutta uh, Tuesday morning. I'm not sure what that makes it here. Yeah, it's still morning. Um, uh, contemplation this week on this sutta of, of nourishing. So this sutta goes through each of them, and I'm going to skip down to doubt. And instead of the word nourished, it's a, it uses the word fuels. So this is another. And what fuels the arising of doubt, or when it's arisen, makes it increase and grow? There are things that are the basis or grounds for doubt. Frequent irrational application of mind to them fuels the arising of doubt, or when it's arisen, makes it increase or grow. Okay, great. It's told us nothing except that there's a basis for doubt and that we should investigate and explore it. So we need to go further down in the sutta and say, okay, so... How do we denourish, defuel, defeed? That's a word, sure. Uh, starve, he uses starve. How do we starve this quality of doubt? And it says, for doubt, there are qualities that are skillful and unskillful, blameworthy and blameless, 
inferior and superior. And I think there's an alternate um, translation I like, uh, coarse or more refined. Um, and those that are on the side of dark or bright. So when we did that uh, directional breathing, I feel a quality of brightness. So when we pay frequent and rational, wise attention to the source of these qualities and characteristics, we begin to starve that doubt because we're applying wisdom. It's a little bit of a thinking thing, but I think when you put the embodiment practices of what is skillful, blameless, refined, bright. When you ask that, if, if oh, what was, uh, I, I, I hope I can pull up, um, Paul had said that ethics, you know that you're doing something ethical when your body does not rebel. You know that you're doing something, that your sila, your moral compass is rightly aligned when there's nothing in your body that goes, Ugh, or oh, the, 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 that kind of cringing. When, you're, when you can stay open, you are aligned and moving with the skillful, blameless, refined quality. So use your body awareness as your barometer, thermometer, whatever you know you want to call it. And I'm curious, I want to open it up. Have you experienced the difference between the state of I'm acting in the world skillfully and the state and experience of I did something that was a little out of alignment with the precepts. My speech was off, or oh, I harmed, or or I was completely open and honest and showed up. So I want to open it up, and, and we can cycle back through me talking, or we can just keep going depending on conversation, depending on what emerges. Any comments or experiences around this investigation of denourishing doubt. Oh, one more thing first. This, this quality of starving um, doubt by looking at these is actually the definition of how you nourish the foundation of my, uh, sorry, the um, awakening factor of investigation of dhammas, dhamma vijaya, vijaya. So that's one of the seven factors. When you're denourishing doubt, you are nourishing, you're doing something different in your body and in your actions in the world and in your heart, mind, space, which is all integrated. You're doing something different that is nourishing one of the awakening factors. So you can, you can look at it either, I need to kind of tamp that down or I need to raise that up. And you're kind of doing, it's it's that motion of coming into the, the dignity. So comments, experiences, uh, questions, explorations. And online, you're welcome and included. Okay, I'm going to... Um just go out there for a big reveal. I don't know if this is directly related, but um, I was thinking about having a, oh, I don't know, a few days ago feeling sort of a little dark, a little low, a little like doubtful of myself and everything. And then I was like, oh, what I really need to do is watch a great Netflix series. <laughs> <laughs> so I found this really great show <laughs> Surfer Teenagers in Australia 
<laughs> then, but I was like, okay, I'm watching, I'm watching. I'm I was nourishing the um doubt, but I was watching myself <laughs> nourish the doubt, which oh. was a tiny seed yeah. of investigation. But um I did notice, you know, of course, you watch a few episodes of my body didn't actually and my mind didn't feel bright. I, I actually uh, felt um well actually my eyes hurt mm -hmm. um from the I think from the screen. But anyway, so the, I'm I'm just like throwing that out there as like what came to mind. Can we and, can we explore that a oh, little bit? Okay. <laughs> Oh, what did you just do? What did you just do when I said, can we? I can't, I, I can't believe I'm confessing. <laughs> oh, my no, Australian let, let's, surfer. Let's not drama. worry about the Australian super dudes. Okay, let's just, let's, let's just leave them out there on the ocean. What just happened, if you're willing to say, what just happened when I said, can we explore this? I don't know if people saw the, but well, did you? I went like that. You, yeah. Okay, so those that you probably can't see, um, you can't quite see my body either. <laughs> uh, okay, can we tip the camera down just a little bit? <laughs> so I'm just gonna mimic. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure, we can explore that. <laughs> okay. Um. And I just, because this is what we do. This is what we do. And maybe this is more of, yeah, we can. And I'm going to go into my little doubt cave to do it from. <laughs> Let's bring the surfer dudes back in. When you thought that was feeding the doubt and maybe, maybe it was, I think, I think it was just like a deflection. It's a strategy. It's a strategy of like, okay, I don't want to feel when I'm feeling or dwell in it. And please let me know if I'm picking too much here. Or so. Okay, all right. So, so you used a strategy and then you brought in the investigation. You brought in this taste of, um, okay, surfer dudes. Yeah, that's kind of nice, but repeatedly watching the next episode, <laughs> what's going on at the end. And not only was there more that you felt like was going away as you were describing it, can you maybe go back and sense what was going on in your body as you describe or go back to that experience of, I've just done a, 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 a mini binge with Australian super dudes. Well, it's taking my mind off of a present moment direct experience okay that's that's up here that's what up. was going on when as you as you came out of it and you were going to move to i don't know maybe it's time now to go to bed or whatever what was the state and flavor of your experience what were you doing in your body Well, I suppose kind of react, like going to the grocery store and it's so overstimulating. There's sort of like a, uh, yeah, letting it reverberate out because it's so much stimulus. But the water is amazing. <laughs> I just think if you want to see water and waves. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, yeah, reacting, letting it yeah. come out. Yeah, yeah. So... There is something good about you. Uh, you've probably heard about the different ways that you can redirect the mind from an unwholesome, and one is substitution. So you substituted with some Netflix, and that's not necessarily unwholesome or wholesome or any judgment whatsoever. There are there's a bodily reaction that happens when you move away from the first state and into this state. I'm guessing maybe some relaxation was happening at that time. No. So there was some aspects that were nourishing and then continue. And I'm able to relay this because I've been there, not because I'm 
reading something that you're saying because I've been on those net Netflix. I, not since monastic life. I don't have a Netflix account, but um, other things are possible too. There's a whole lot out there to distract. And I've done the distraction and then I've kept going on the distraction and it's become what I call the rabbit hole and I'm down it. And I come out of the rabbit hole and I go, oh, I feel hung over. Mm. <laughs> And so then at that point, if I wasn't able to practice, what does it feel like being in this rabbit hole? And is it, you know, skillful, brightening, refined, and I'm not remembering the fourth one. Uh, it doesn't, you know, you get the flavor of it. Um, then maybe I can start to make other choices and I could maybe turn to some of the other enlightenment factors. What about cultivating joy? What about cultivating tranquility? What about cultivating stillness or balance? And of course, mindfulness is in there to help guide us in the process. So I'll stop picking on you now, but I love that you brought it right to what we do. You look for surfer dudes or whatever your well, role is. There are women too, just saying. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, I, I did. I, I fell into a... <laughs> I did. Thank you. Okay. Would anyone else like to talk? <laughs> I'll share. Um, thanks for your vulnerability. And, you know, in the scheme of things that humans pursue for pleasure, I think, yeah, surfer stuff on Netflix, is, this feels <laughs> Right. And so... But but I think I had this really powerful like insight as we were exploring this, like how you kind of like went, like how your body, like, because it's kind of a, that's the illuminating gift of this practice is like, let's just explore this. Yeah. And because it's, I think I forget and I, and in my work and my understanding of human experience and the mind with other people because shame is so powerful in all of us i think maybe we all or most of us forget that like that we're more alike in that like averse like oh yeah the binging and the, all of these things and so i was like oh what what is it like to just hold that openness in investigating even that binge Exactly. even the shame even the darkness all, all of it everything that right the anger the irritation the shame the sadness the loneliness it's all kind of coming up and so it's like can i sit with that open heart or strong soft presence yes. even if i have that intention even <laughs> if i kind of that i sort of had that powerful at least that's what I sensed was like, oh, that's what this is about. I think you, you've you really seen, yes, this is what it's all about. It's all about being able to cultivate the wholesome qualities in a way so that we can show up vulnerably to everything, at which point there's enough spaciousness in us that we can begin to see the, the, the real, the unreal that, you know, because we're not shying away. We're open and warm. And um, so Paul is an Aikido teacher, teacher. Lisa has a black belt in Kempo karate. So they've got these embodied martial capacities as they're practicing. I don't have that. I have a dance background. So, you know, coming in from a, a different angle into what it is to move the body. But what Paul teaches is if we want to be um, empowered to show up to all of it, if I want to protect, so if I want to protect my belly, what posture, what should I do with my arms? Anyone want to like put a posture? Okay. So I'm seeing this, seeing this and seeing this. Um, so, so this sort of close like, pr protective, well, if, if, and we could do this kind of exploration on Monday when we're actually in an embodied 
the practice space. So please come back because I want to play. <laughs> this, this position then makes it possible to get poked here. I, you know, I can't move around. Um, this position might feel like it's protecting, but it's actually cutting me off. And so when we do an embodiment practice, this protects because now I have the flexibility to move and respond. And this, with a warm, smiling heart, makes it possible for me to deflect or move or hold and, you know, the Aikido practice of going with and then changing the direction to something that we would choose to be more wholesome. You know, manipulating into goodness, I would say, is worthwhile. And that is from this open, warm-hearted showing up that allows us to have the confidence in all that's arising so the mind is not going, no, 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 I don't want to see, hear that. I don't want to know about the actual nature of reality because it's too scary. We're now strong enough to walk into it. So thank you for, for, for yeah, noting that that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. And maybe just a lot, even that, even when I am in that place of not wanting to like having maybe a, part of me as much as I can say, okay, that's okay too. Cause that's how it is right now. And mm -hmm. it, it's possible or is it possible to even meet that with, which it's is hard. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and this is, this is an exploration. I don't know if any of you are going on the retreat this weekend with Wynn and I, but that's exactly it. Um, Wynn said that there's at the beginning of, of, a, of the residential zoom retreat, there's this part of deep welcome. And I was looking at, okay, yeah, I kind of know what that concept basically is within the community to be able to, that everyone is welcome. And, you know, and then I looked at, well, that deep welcome has to be for all of the parts of ourselves too. And that deep welcome is out of the, what I do is, oh, sweetheart, of course. Of course, of course you're doing that. And this this might look closed, but what I'm doing is really like giving that part some support and stability, not judging, not blaming. Oh, sweetheart. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> that too. <laughs> yeah. So yes, it's for all the parts of us to be welcome. Online, anyone? Others in the room? Is there any place you wouldn't want to bring this practice? And maybe that's a big question. Is there any place you wouldn't want to bring this practice? Is there any part of yourself you wouldn't want to, and you don't need to speak it out loud, internally explore. Is there any part of yourself? Yes, Gabe. What's coming to mind for me is just sort of um, just how impacted we are by conditions, obviously. And um, you know, I, I was on retreat last week with Kamala Masters and Tara Malay and just so lovely. And uh, um, let me mute someone here. Hang on. Seems someone is unmuted on Zoom. Okay, it's okay. thanks. Um, but anyways, and I saw somebody um 
Kim Allen out in California, it seems like she's offering some teachings around simplicity in lay life. And, you know, I do my best to live a simple life, but I'm also busy. <laughs> and the things, yeah, it's just, I wonder if you have any reflections on just kind of, um, yeah, I find for myself, it's sort of this balance between, you know, just the, the raw facts of like, if I do my best to take time, you know, to intentionally put down my duties and responsibilities, go on retreat as much as I can, it does really seem to make a difference. And then also just like, but also when I, when I am busy or when I am in the midst of activity, how I perceive that just my mental habits, you know, I'm a worrier and, uh, you know, how also that that's at play, like right in the middle of the uncontrollability kind of, you know, not perceive, not knowing that in some ways it's a choice, or at least there's some flexibility there, like perceiving, um, my life as, you know, chaos or as like, <laughs> or even chaos, like chaos is, um, a source of anxiety or chaos is a source of like, kind of aliveness or so yeah any any comments on that i'd appreciate when you're meeting chaos what you're calling chaos a positive negative valence no valence at all just a word um when you're meeting it what is the mind body state what are you doing in the body i think i tend to uh sort of shut down yeah okay. what and what action is that is that a i think it's sort of a tensing like uh, tensing the whole body sort of a guarding uh -huh. mm -hmm. not being fully yeah open sensitive vulnerable so something to experiment with might be chaos. <laughs> ah, like and what happened in your body just even seeing and then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did, did, can you hear your voice? Mm-hmm. I think I've been reflecting on that and sort of noticing. And I think part of it is sort of like this, like the openness. There's a part in which it almost feels the word aggressive comes to mind. Like it's like sort of my mind has this idea. You're either sort of careful, which is good, good to be careful, or you're sort of reckless. So that it's like, you know, to be all in or like, not afraid i think there's part of my mind that's a you know it's like much safer to just you know worry about everything <laughs> <laughs> except it's really well, painful <laughs> play with it yeah play with it yeah play with what what the embodiment of worry is mm -hmm. and play with what the embodiment of what you're saying reckless is and then play with the embodiment of like ready to play mm -hmm um and and just just feel into it uh how you and each you're making choices as you create your schedule so this thing you're calling busy for someone else might be labeled full and um versatile and alive and um and someone else might call it overwhelming and disturbing and draining you know so start to see as I put this in my calendar and I attend to it, how am I showing up to it? And am I with it or am I concerned about the next thing on my calendar? And so you'll find there's more safety and security in the body and in your cap capabilities if you're with what you're with, when you're with it, and then there is the transition that what I was doing in the beginning to be able to go and ground into the next thing. And so then you're ready to play. 
with your next step. Mm, that's really helpful. Thank you. And can you give me, we're at 15 till, is this the transition? That what's? Yeah, we can go right up till nine. If, if okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and anybody who needs to leave this or the Zoom space to care for yourself, please do so. Um, but I, I'm happy to continue. I'm really, uh, I'm not against play, but it's like, <laughs> I know I'm not going to get paid for it, is the thing. And uh, that's, that's like, um, I mean that literally, but also like, kind of in my own body, like, I feel like I've, I, my, my father and my grandfather, <laughs> they like, they come up a lot in like, and I'm like perceiving that a lot more and like all the, like, especially under conditioning, like, it's like, there, there's no play. <laughs> this is like, this is a, like, this is a war zone I live, I live in that I perceive every day. And I, I work in healthcare too. And I was like, people treat each other so cruelly. And like, it, it just seems like the play is like really not indicated a lot of the time. Yeah. So can you speak to that? Oh, this is bro. Yeah. Thank you. This is important. The so what I heard was uh, I'm not against play. <laughs> um, but it doesn't really belong in the world we're actually living in. Now, <laughs> oh, in in the medical environment, and then you mentioned a war zone, like the the world that we're in. There are people who are really in war zones. And they have to face really horrible things happening. And you're trying to save lives and work with people to have a more well-being. And yet you and your colleagues are doing what? <laughs> or the system is doing what? And whatever environment you're in, this probably applies. <laughs> it's not just healthcare. So... Mark, Mark Nunberg, uh, as I was transitioning from lay life when I was employed and going to work and on a project and all of this, and then I was heading for monastic life, but I still had a contract and I wanted to honor it. So I had this transition space where it was really hard to go to work because I actually was at the point where uh, yeah, I also heard you say something about I'm not getting paid for play. Well, I was at a point where I had enough savings that I didn't need to make money during my ending of that contract before heading out to monastic life. So there wasn't like, I need to pay the rent, so I need to go to work. So it was like, what is my motivation? So I asked Mark about it. And he says, what if your work is Donna? And Donna, for anyone, that, that, that's the generosity. It's a, it's a giving. What if your work is giving? And if your company happens to pay you, what if that's Donna? What if you receive it as a generous act that they're supporting you with this funds that you can then apply to other things? Like, oh, well, might as well play <laughs> with this idea. And I be, went to work the next day or whenever, whenever it was, and I started looking around. And I'm like, okay, this is an act of generosity. My colleague Keith needs this software update so that he can do his part of checking those things in and go home to his wife and kids. It's a generous act for me to complete this so that he can go do what's nourishing for him. Oh, Liana needs this report because, you know, for her, this is gonna be a, a next step in her career and I can support by offering this report. And it even became, as I was interacting with people, um, oh, you know what? I'm gonna change this relationship I'm not doing work meetings over lunch anymore. 
I would love to have lunch with you, but we're not going to talk about work. We're going to have some more mindfulness and some more taking time out. Um, and it started to shift my relationships. I began, I, I didn't have the same practice of the open, and but I began to do that in little ways. I was bringing my Buddhist ethic approach, characteristics and qualities into my relationships with clients and coworkers and bosses and suppliers and all of this. And it really began to shift the whole dynamic of the space I was in. So if we're in a war zone and there's an enemy, it is a great place to play. It's a great place to play with these practices and feel what we feel and to be able to show up and soften and hold and eventually we have the resilience that the enemy is not the enemy anymore. I've been experiencing this. I've seen others experience this. It's a lot of play practice to change the body state, but it changes relationships and it builds community in places you didn't know it was even possible. If you need another word as a transition between war zone and play, take it little steps at a time and hold that too. Thank you. Happy to speak with you or anyone else more about that because it's it's big. It's very big. And you can hold what arises as you respond. It's like, oh, is there a spot that's tensing? Is there a tightening? Is there a twisting? Is there a tear? Is there tearing? And hold that with the same warm, open, spacious, yes. This too. Yeah, play. Uh, I talk a lot. Well, I do a lot of stuff that looks like play. Mm -hmm. And um, and and what I, and what I've told my friends quite a bit is though, although my life looks like I'm playing a lot, you know, when you were talking about offering Donna, offering generosity, you know, and I'm self-employed, and uh, but I also teach classes that involve play, and. I realize I don't feel as playful as it all looks. And and really wanting that to, to line up, to really, you know, change my relationship with all these wonderful things that I do, because I do a lot of things that I love. But I should be, yeah, there's just, um, but I bring an attitude. Part of it is overwhelm. Is feeling like there's way too much play, way too much things. I was also on the retreat and it was too short as far as I'm concerned. And I want to go back because of that simplicity and to really learn how do I bring that into a life that, that most people that would look at my life would go, wow, yeah. You know, it's not like there's a lot of money, but there's a lot of good stuff. And it's like, yeah, what's missing here? How am I not practicing with all this wonderful stuff and and letting it really inform my relationship with all of my aspects? 
that are within me, some of which I try to push off my bus. Mm -hmm. So even when it gets serious, the way that we can show up to, because what we have a kind of a synonymous of serious means important. And so that's where the attention goes. And when I'm there, I should be narrowing in on it and solving and this kind of flavor. I'm curious about I mean, I know you, I've seen you play. And I've seen you play with that kind of freedom that's relaxed. And then occasionally where it's a little bit more performative, maybe. And so I would wonder about the exploration of these characteristics that we outlined today of the, the skillful, the bright, you know, the the refined, the so as you go into whatever you're labeling as work, play, or any engagement, internal and external, if you look at the qualities of how the showing up is happening, so it doesn't really matter uh, what what word you want to put on it, because your work is your play, and your play is your work because of the nature of the work play you do. And what is it that needs to be nourished? Maybe it's one of the other factors of enlightenment that needs to be given some growth space. So I'm not going to answer your question. I'm going to give you the sense of exploration that can be done. And when I say play, that's what I'm talking about is it's it's like, I'm all in to show up to this so that I can be wiser, so that I can be freer, and so that I can bring that embodiment as an example to others as I navigate in all of the spaces that I'm navigating. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really I really do show up when I'm doing my my work, whether it's classes or clients or whatever. And then I kind of put it down mm -hmm. when I'm not doing that. And so the exploration is really not during my work time. It's during all the rest of the time mm -hmm. and how in the relationship I'm having with my boss who I cannot get away from because right. it's me because you're self-employed <laughs> yeah 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 exploration i'm going to put little signs up all over the place saying exploration Explor yeah. yeah use that word exploration exploration and maybe because we're getting to the top of the hour here maybe we we integrate that together because there's there's some you know some some stuff that's coming up and one way that we can kind of be with that and clear that and hold that and bring the body back into a willingness, if you wish. You could move your arms as if you're like conducting an orchestra. Yeah, whatever movement is open some space around you. <laughs> brings you back in to the body. Allows for whatever is present to be present. Nothing's pushed away. And smiling and settling. Giving ourselves the stability, the ground beneath us, lifting a little into the sky above us, still grounded, coming into this dignified length 
and capacity to do the exploration, to live the exploration. Play. Thank you. Brief announcement. I'm Chuck, your volunteer host for the evening. I have brought up Donna. I'll re bring it up about how the center has operated since 1993. All the programs and classes here have been offered freely without a fee set for you to receive in your heart. And then when uh, you've had time to examine what your heart might want to do back, you can respond. When we have a guest teacher, two thirds of the Donna for that night goes to the teacher's livelihood. Uh, the other third goes to uh, common ground. There's a Donna bowl on the other side of the wall uh, of the monitor. There's also a square reader. You can also donate uh, at the website or by Venmo. Just put Aya's name in the memo line or the teacher line, A-Y-Y-A. -Y -Y and if you have any questions, you can come up and ask me afterwards. Aya, thank you for these great teachings tonight. It was fun to be here together. Thank you.